Bill, thank you for joining Judith and me today. We are so excited to be able to have this conversation with you. Christoph Schweitzer, our new CEO, and I send out the note that we joined Breakthrough Energy Catalyst, and we're one of the seven founding partners. The response across BCG was incredible to both of us. Now, you'd already founded Breakthrough Energy a number of years ago, and you've had Breakthrough Energy Ventures, I guess, going for a while. How did you get to the need for Breakthrough Energy Catalyst, and how do you see it distinct from what Breakthrough Energy Ventures was intended to do? Yeah, well, it's phenomenal to have BCG as a partner and, and also the help you're providing, bringing in new partners and helping us think how we take this money and spend it uh, extremely well is, is going to make a huge difference. The pipeline of innovation, you know, starts with R&D. Uh, and so in Paris in 2015, uh, a lot of country leaders and I announced mission innovation and they committed to double their energy R&D. But they turned to me and said, will the private sector, uh, both in terms of venture capital and project scaling, take any ideas that come out of that R&D and really make sure they get out there? Right. So the first stage of that is ventures, which is you know, high risk capital. And now we have about 50 small companies across the different areas of emissions. Those innovations are ready to be put into projects and scaled up. If you say to the governments, hey, do these projects, that's outside of their skill set. And yet, because these uh, green products aren't yet economic, green steel, green cement, green aviation fuel, the government has to provide either the tax credits or some of that financing. So how do we get the small company innovation, you know, private sector management and government resources to come together to recreate what happened with solar panels or with lithium ion batteries, that is that even though the price started at a very high premium, eventually the cost was competitive without subsidy. And you know, climate to me is about making sure green products uh, don't sell at a premium. And you know, we've got 30 years. If we can do that, then we can say to India, hey, or all the countries, but I always view them as paradigmatic, please use the green products uh, and it, we won't be telling them to slow down building those houses you know, at half the rate uh, because of, of a very high green premium. So Catalyst it will partner with governments. In any project, our money will probably be less than 10%. Uh, we'll help design the bidding and the project. Um, we'll, we hope to actually grant money during 2022 uh, for projects in the four areas we've picked. And so it's about innovation, it's about the economics of, of scaling up. Um, you know, four or five miracles like solar panels and the batteries would get us to dramatic emissions reductions. So let's talk about those four technologies, right? Direct air capture, hydrogen, long duration storage, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, why those four? And are you, uh, what leads your sense of optimism around those four? Yeah, these are some of the tougher problems. And, you know, the framework for climate can't just be to work on the easy stuff, you know, and even the easy stuff's not super easy, like getting uh, passenger cars to switch to be electric. But when it comes to the reliability of the grid, you've got to have long-term storage to be able to have a very high percentage of renewables. Uh, you know, aviation, the density of energy requirement is beyond what batteries will ever deliver. So for the long flights, how do you make that fuel? Uh, and yet, you know, today the price would be twice as much. So each of these areas are just coming out of the labs with some good ideas, ready for a lot of countries to say, okay, we want to host this work. Uh, that'll give us a chance of having that industry and the jobs around that industry. Uh, so they have that reason as they replace the hydrocarbon jobs uh, to get involved in these things. To be in there early and kind of unnaturally accelerate uh, that uh, so that we can hit these very ambitious climate goals we have that's going to be very exciting in the next five years. And how will you know, or how do you think we'll know, you know, all of us together working on this, that we're making the progress we want to make in these four technology areas? What are the markers for you that will indicate we're on the right track? 
Well, the, the key thing is that green premium. So today, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, you know, which we all buy to offset our own um, uh, emissions, is twice as expensive. Uh, twice as expensive to make. And there's some places like California that help out a little bit, so it's not quite uh, that expensive there, which is, is, is a great thing. If you can drive that premium down to zero, you know, then it's, it's night and day. You can take a whole area of emissions and just say, okay, innovation uh, took care of that. And all the talk about subsidies and, you know, will workers' incomes go down as you do this? Will there be a backlash? You avoid all that if innovation gets the, the cost to the right place. It's interesting, I was talking to the CEO of one of the leading fertilizer makers, you know, so ammonia is the key thing. And he was saying if they wanna have a ton of uh, green ammonia uh, for farmers, uh, it will take five to seven years to build a plant. So you're right, a lot of it is changing the expectations of people of the curve it's on so that they're ready to take the bet for five years out to believe that they can do it. And right now, there's a lot of reluctance to get you know, there's a lot of questions about where it'll be and will there be customers and how much it will cost. So I, if we can accelerate that and give, bring some confidence to it, I think it would really move things forward much faster. Yeah, 30 years may seem like a long time, but to replace the entire cement production process, steel, fertilizer, you know, we have about 10 years to really get those costs down and then use the rest of that to get this mind-blowing scale up. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, there's no time to waste. One of the things I loved hearing you talk about was that um, we've seen in our work across a lot of different sectors that excluding the hardest to abate sectors, you can get 60, 70 percent of the carbon out in relatively, sometimes no cost way. Sometimes it's just an efficiency project that pays <coughs> for itself. Sometimes it costs something, but it's not unaffordable. Depending on the sector, and depending on the supply chain, that last 20 to 40% can be incredibly expensive. And you're right, it's gonna take years to get people, first to get working on the 60 to 80%, but then to get going on feeling confident to go after that last 20 to 40 is, is the opportunity. Private sector engagement uh, versus six years ago is super dramatic. Uh, you know, climates, we still have to engage even more people. We have to have some luck with the innovation, but the contrast with 2015 is is incredible, and you know now you you're having that dialogue with every one of your customers. Yes, and they want to talk, and the, even in the last two years, I would say from what I see, I mean, I can't tell you how many CEO discussions. I was just doing a new CEO workshop last week, and I brought up climate, but they were so engaging, and many and several of them said. I know I'm not doing what I should. I know I don't understand what I need to understand, but this is going to, their new CEO, this is going to be one of the defining elements of their tenure and what their legacy will be. And I think they get that much more than say CEOs three, four, five years ago, which is exciting. If you look at policy making and timing, right? I mean, you, you also made that point to say the, the transition from one energy mix to the next has to happen so much faster than ever in history, right? It took decades for oil to be 25% of, of, of the energy mix. Now this has to happen so fast. And then you look at times to get a high voltage power line built or an offshore wind park. So when you look at policy making and how we can accelerate this, do you see any great practice emerging somewhere where you say, look, uh, policy making can really help be a lot faster in that transition? Well, the reduction of CO2 emission has been strong in the UK, the host country for COP. And I think it's partly because they merged in business energy, you know, and got the analytic and the scientific framework and these aggressive goals together, you know, and started to think that through. Europe as a whole is in the lead right now. The willingness to get out in front, uh, you know, even think about, okay, how do you have to have a border tax as you're pushing this transition for some of these big industries, car industry, steel, cement industry, how do you not disadvantage your local manufacturers? That's very hard to do. And yet, you know, the willingness, uh, they've set goals that basically require them to move into some of the hard areas. You cannot meet the European goals just by doing electricity generation and passenger cars. You have to get into home heating uh, and all the, the different industrial things. So. You know, thank goodness Europe is willing to lead in that way. 
uh, if the innovation can go fast enough, then the voters in the EU will feel like, okay, the burden I'm being asked to bear uh, by paying these premiums is modest enough that I'm proud that we're in the vanguard. If we're not smart and we don't in innovate, those premiums could be large enough that the you know, political consensus around Europe leading in climate change could come into question you know, in, in various elections. So, uh, so far, you know, Europe's got the best plan and everyone else is saying, okay, can I uh, follow along uh, based on that excellent example? You have this slightly daunting list of the 18 technologies, right, where you say, look, it's really about increasing the supply of innovation, everything from nuclear fusion that we talked about to electric fuels. And, and for us, we look at this both at BCG, but also for our clients as, my God, where are we going to find, train, educate, and deploy the talent who can do all of this? So I'd be curious to see how you think about it and specifically how you think about it to make sure this doesn't only happen in the world's richest countries. Well, the richest countries, what they really owe to the middle income countries is to make those green premiums very, very low. To the low income countries, which fortunately are a small part of emissions, you know, we may need to subsidize direct air capture uh, to allow them to continue to grow economically without these constraints. But, you know, it, we shouldn't think of developing countries in one bucket. We should take the middle income uh, and the low income and, and have different policies. The labor shortage point is really acute right now. I mean, here you have all these new projects coming in at a time when labor shortages exist in so many sectors of the economy. Some things can be automated. You know, AI, a lot of people get afraid that we'll go too far in terms of uh, making jobs more efficient or eliminating jobs. Uh, you know, that is the thing that can help with the labor shortage and free up, say, construction trade people to work on uh, the catalyst type projects. I do worry about that. And, you know, as people see the inflation uh, coming, you know, will, there, will that shake their commitment to the, the shift we need to make uh, for climate? You describe yourself, or at least you have, as an impatient optimist, as, uh, particularly as it relates to the role that technology can play. We are also impatient optimists in terms of the roles that our clients can play, and I think this is a place where the intersection of those two, what people can do today and the role that technology can play tomorrow, is really very powerful and to be able to be a partner with you on this breakthrough energy catalyst journey is something that we're genuinely excited about so thank you so much for joining the two of us today we've really really appreciated it well thanks for the partnership we have a lot of fun work to do together totally agree